In order to describe the way that hemoglobin binds oxygen in a cooperative fashion, we came up with two different models. One of these models became known as the concerted model and the other model became known as the sequential model. Now, the first question you might be thinking is, why do we need two different models to describe a single phenomenon in nature? Well, as it turns out, each of these models alone does not correctly describe some aspect of the way that oxygen binds onto hemoglobin in a cooperative fashion. And where one model basically fails, the other model succeeds and vice versa. And that's exactly why we have to combine these two models to correctly describe the mechanism by which hemoglobin binds oxygen cooperatively. So let's begin with the concerted model. And this is the diagram that describes the concerted model. Now, the big point about the concerted model is hemoglobin can only exist in two states. It can either exist in the T state, the tense state, or it can exist in the R state, the relaxed state. And by binding oxygen onto that hemoglobin molecule, all we're doing, according to this model, is shifting the equilibrium between the two states. And to see what we mean, let's take a look at the left side of this diagram. So on the left side, right here, none of the heme groups on the hemoglobin actually contain oxygen. And so what that means is the arrow going this way will be much longer than the arrow going this way. And what that means is in this particular situation, when we have deoxyhemoglobin, when none of the heme groups contain an oxygen, the structure will be predominantly and almost exclusively in the T state. Now, what happens when we bind a single oxygen onto that heme group? So, for example, when we fill this oxygen, what happens is the arrow, goes, uh, the arrow going this way becomes ever so slightly longer. And what that means is the equilibrium shifts slightly towards this side, towards the R state. But in this particular case, our structure will still be predominantly in the T state. Now, if we add one more oxygen so that two of these heme groups are filled, what we see happen is the arrow becomes longer going this way, and now these two arrows are equal in size. And what that means is both of these states will exist in the same proportion, so 50-50. Now, if we add one more oxygen, what we see happen is the equilibrium now shifts towards the R state, and this arrow becomes longer than this arrow and so now what we see happen is this is the structure the state of the hemoglobin that will predominate and finally if we add one more oxygen what happens is we shift our equilibrium almost entirely towards the R state and now this state will exist exclusively as our R state this hemoglobin molecule will exist exclusively in that R state now, let's take a look at the following diagram. So, what this diagram basically describes is the oxygen binding curve for the T state, and it is described by this shallow curve here. And this R state is described by this steep curve right over here. And to actually obtain that sigmoidal curve that we actually see for the hemoglobin oxygen binding, we have to combine these two curves to basically get this sigmoidal curve. So the sigmoidal curve for hemoglobin is formed from the combination of the T state curve, this curve here, the shallow one, and the steep one, the R state curve. Now, the final thing I'd like to discuss about the concerted model is, what's the limitation of the concerted model? What is the problem? Well, the problem is the following. Let's take a look at the following diagram. What this diagram basically describes is when our oxygen binds onto one of the heme groups of hemoglobin, this is the state that will predominate. Now, according to the concerted model, this structure of this polypeptide that contains the bound oxygen does not change its conformation. It initially is a square and it still is a square. 
Now, we know experimentally in nature, as soon as that oxygen binds onto that heme groom of that polypeptide, that changes the conformation of that polypeptide. And this is simply is not what we see according to this diagram. In fact, what we also see in nature is when one of the heme groups binds that oxygen, the adjacent heme groups are also affected. There, they increase their affinity for oxygen because they change their shape as well. And this is something that we don't see according to this model. So the problem with this model is if we examine this particular diagram here even though we have one oxygen bound and even though this is the state that will predominate this structure here should technically have a slightly different shape a slightly different conformation which is not something that we see based on this model and so to compensate for that limitation we came up with a second model that we call the sequential model so let's take a look at what the sequential model actually tells us. So in the sequential model, what we see happen is as soon as one of these heme groups, for example, this one binds the oxygen, that heme group completely changes its shape and that changes the shape of the entire polypeptide that contains the heme group. And that's why when going from this structure to, uh, uh, to this structure, this entire square becomes a circle because it changes its conformation. And not only that, but the nearby polypeptide chains will also change their conformation slightly and that tells us that their affinity for oxygen which will, uh, will also increase, which is what we see happening in nature. So if we add one more oxygen, this will basically change our shape and this nearby structure will also change its polypeptide chain. If we add one more oxygen, we get this and finally, if this one is filled, we get the R state. So the major difference between the concerted model and the sequential model is in the concerted model, we only have either the T state or the R state, but in this particular case, we have the T state, we have the R state, and we also have these three intermediates, intermediate one, intermediate two, and intermediate three. So in the sequential model, the binding of the oxygen stimulates a conformational change in that polypeptide. And that in turn induces a conformational change in this nearby and this nearby polypeptide chain. And that tells us that because the conformation changes, that will increase the affinity of, of that heme group for the oxygen molecule. Now, what's the problem with this sequential model? Well, the problem with the sequential model is the following. Based on this model, the only time we have the R state is when all these four different heme groups are completely filled with oxygen. So according to our sequential model, this is the only time that our structure will exist in the R state. And we know that is not true. We know in nature what we see experimentally is when three of those heme groups are filled with oxygen, the structure of the hemoglobin will exist predominantly in the R state, which is exactly what we see according to our concerted model. Based on the concerted model, when three of these uh, heme groups are filled with oxygen, our R state will predominate. So this arrow will be longer than this arrow, which is basically the correct description of what actually happens in nature. But according to this diagram here, if three of these groups are filled with oxygen, our molecule still exists in some intermediate state. It will not exist in the R state. So that is the limitation of the sequential model. And notice that this is compensated by the concerted model. And that's exactly why we have to use both of these models to basically correctly describe the mechanism by which hemoglobin actually binds oxygen. So
In conclusion, neither model can describe the cooperative nature of hemoglobin alone. Instead, we have to combine these two models to actually correctly describe the, the mechanism by which hemoglobin binds oxygen. That is, the sequential model succeeds where the concerted model fails and vice versa. So these two models can be used to basically describe the way that hemoglobin binds oxygen in a cooperative fashion.